Well, good morning and happy Sunday to you, everybody. It's so good to be with you on this Sunday, the first Sunday in June. We're kicking off a brand new series today called Rhythm, and I am so excited about it because here's the point. Every year at Access in the summer, we have this thing happen where summertime happens, and summer is a beautiful, fun time for people where they go on vacations and they travel and the kids get out of school and college students go home for the summer. But in the summer, one of the things we've seen is that as we dig deep together, that we all grow. And what's been amazing is every summer, Access has grown throughout the summer. It's something that doesn't happen in churches around the country and it's happening here every single summer so this summer here's my challenge to you. for the next eight weeks we're going to be in a series called rhythm together and as we dig into this series together I'm going to challenge all of you to do whatever you can to be here if you can't be here watch online and reconnect with us in that way because here's what I believe that if we'll all connect together over these next eight weeks God's going to use the series to really draw us closer into relationship with him it's gonna be a lot of fun so today I want to kind of kick this series off and get us going with a simple idea now I'm a huge sports fan I don't know if you're sports fan or not, but in my family, this time of the year for me is just tough because base, I mean, basketball season is ending. It'll be over in the next week or two weeks. Uh, and then after basketball season's over, there's like nothing for several months. I mean, there's baseball, but there's nothing for several months. And, and after the baseball season is kind of starting to wind down, football comes back. And that's when I know that God is on the throne, that he's leading us and guiding us. And, and I love football season. So in the summer though, there's not much sports and there's not much good TV. You know what I'm talking about? Like all the shows go on hiatus. But in my family, if you were to come spend a week with my family, you would know that there is one show in the summer that we watch together as a family. It's American Ninja Warrior. Anybody watch this show? I love this show. I was watching it a couple nights ago, and um, I just realized this is kind of like a modern day American Gladiators. Anybody remember that show? Remember that? It had like Nitro and Diamond and all the people had like stripper names. And uh, it, was just, it was super fun. But the show, if you don't know the show, the show is just a series of physical challenges to see if you can get through this grueling course and everyone gets harder and harder and harder. Well, my son Joey, he's eight years old, he's almost nine. Joey loves American Ninja Warrior. Like when I say loves it, he absolutely loves it. He loves it so much that last year for his birthday, last August, I created my own American Ninja Warrior course for Joey. I called it American Ninja Warrior and I made this course for him. Here's a quick video of it. This is Joey, it says American Ninja warrior and, and I made a course similar to what you would find on the show mine was probably a little more challenging than the show um, but we whoa everything we did it was just fun like I, I gave everything a name this was you had to take the rope swing over the pool of death you know just something that just inspired my kids and it was just fun this whole thing was fun I'll never forget when Joey came home from school that day he saw this thing and his eyes lit up his eyes got the size of Texas as he saw it and he did it was funny Liz was freaking out about this this wood plank that he had to walk across and I'm like babe what's the worst case scenario here you know and uh, anyways at the end of this there was a slide and then if you've seen the show there's always what they call the warp wall the warp wall is that curved wall you have to run up and grab a hold of and pull your way up onto and so this was our warp wall it was a big water slide and listen I was dad of the year that day I mean <laughs> may not be the best dad every day but on that day I schooled all of you it was awesome now a couple nights ago, my, my son and I, we, we stayed up late and we recorded an episode of American Ninja Warrior and it was so fun. It was American Ninja Warrior All-Stars. And at, what they did is every, every um, they did, took all the different elements of the show and they created challenges for them. And so they did the warp wall and they kept adding height to it to see who could get the highest on the warp wall. Well, at the end of the show, they did something called the salmon ladder. Do you know what the salmon ladder is? The salmon ladder is a crossbar that you hold on to and you have to do a pull up and pull yourself up and you have to keep lifting over and over till you get the, the bar on the next rung up. And at the end of the show, they did a competition and they had a three story high, 35 rung thing. And so this is the salmon ladder. And so we're watching it. This dude was unbelievable. He made it all the way to the top, all 35 rungs. And we're watching this and I can't even imagine how physical this is. I can't imagine how hard this would be. So we're watching it and my son Joey, who's eight now, he leans over to me and he he goes, Dad, you could totally do that. <laughs> and, and being a dad of integrity and not wanting to crush my son, I just look back at him and I'm like, you know it, dude. I could do that all day long. And uh, I just want to confess to you now, I could not do that all day long. But, but in his mind, I totally, I totally could. Um, if I tried my hardest, if, if we left here today and you constructed a 35 rung high salmon ladder, if I went out and wanted it as bad as anyone's ever wanted it, if I tried as hard as anyone has ever tried, if I gave it my best college effort, there is no chance in the world that I could ever conceivably do that. I couldn't. Trying harder wasn't going to make it possible for me. 
If I said to you, all of you, that after service today, in the lobby, we've got brand new Nikes, all different sizes. We've got running shorts and t-shirts for everybody. And after the service, I need everyone to go change. And then we're going to leave here and we're going to run a marathon together. 26.2 miles. That would leave from here and land us close to the Brandon Mall. That's a long ways away. Now imagine that all of us did this together. How many of you could possibly do it? There's a handful maybe that could do it. But the reality is no matter how hard I tried, I probably couldn't do it. If I tried hard, if I willed myself to it, if I ate some Wheaties that morning and hopped up on Red Bull, like I couldn't conceivably do it if I wanted to. There's a difference between trying for something and training for something. Here's the point. I don't think that I could do the salmon ladder and I don't think that I could do the marathon, but if you gave me a year and you said, Jason, we're gonna pay you for a year, you don't have to work, you don't have to, to lead access, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is focus on running a marathon or all you have to do is focus on doing the salmon ladder. I'm not saying I would ever be as good as the people who do it there, but, but I'm sure with practice and over time, all of us could get to the point where we could, we could run a marathon and we could do some of the salmon ladder. You see, there's a difference between trying hard for something and training for something. And I don't know about you, but like, I don't know if you're here and you're a runner, but they say about runners that sometimes when runners run for a long time and they get good at it, they experience what's called a runner's high. Has anyone ever experienced a runner's high before? Several of you, I never have experienced that before. I've experienced a cupcake high. I mean, holler at me, you know what I'm saying? A little donut high, but I have never, and a cheeseburger, cheeseburger sounds good. I've experienced a cheeseburger high. I have never ever had a runner's high, I haven't. But they say that when you do something for a long time, eventually what happens is it goes from being a job to something you love. It goes from being something that you have to do out of duty to something that becomes you, something that you experience out of delight. In the same way, there are certain parts of our lives that if we'll move past trying and we'll move to training, I believe that we'll experience them in a different way. In your relationships, the relationship you have with your kids or your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend. In those relationships, there's a difference between trying and hoping things work out and actually training for it. Let me explain what I mean. If I just tried in my relationship with Liz, if I just said, man, I'm a good person, so I hope that she'll love me, she will. But my relationship with Liz will go farther, we'll love each other at a deeper level if I'll make the decision to do things that, that train myself to love her. If I pay attention to her, if I listen to her, she tells me about her day. As I pay attention and write little notes for the things she says, you know, I've really wanted one of those things. So pay attention to those and I write them down and I surprise her just for no reason because I love her. You can't try hard enough, but you can train yourself in a way to get better and better. In the same way, I believe that all of our relationships with God, you can't just pray a prayer and hope that things get better. You can't. But here's what I do know. You can train yourself. You can develop a certain rhythm, a cadence to your life. And as you develop the rhythm, as you do these certain things, what will happen is you'll move from knowing about God to actually knowing him. You'll move from doing rituals that you think you have to do in order to keep God happy to doing things that you love out of delight, out of joy. You will begin to experience that relationship in a profound, deep kind of way. So for the next eight weeks, we're going to talk about these things. Now, the, the reason for all that is found in the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, Paul is talking and he gives us these instructions. Here's what Paul says. He says, train yourself to be godly. Now, what he says is this. I love this. He says, you can, you can do this. You can make the decision that you're going to work at it and you're going to do everything you can to grow in your relationship with God to become godly. Train yourself to become godly. Verse 8. He says, for physical training is of some value, meaning if you work out and do all kinds of exercise, it will have some value to your body. But godliness has value for all things. Meaning if you become more and more like Jesus, eventually it's going to affect every area of your life. He says it's holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So what Paul says is this, is that all of us have to make a decision that we're not just going to settle into our relationship with God, but instead we're going to pursue him. We're going to train. We're going to make the decision to work at it, to become more like Jesus. And as a result, here's what I'm telling you. If we'll develop this rhythm, this cadence, eventually these things that we're talking about for these next few weeks will move from being something you do out of duty, out of obligation, to something that happens out of delight that you want to do with all of your heart. So today, I want to look at one interesting angle that, in my opinion, is really one of the starting points for developing this rhythm, this cadence in your relationship with God. Now, a few weeks ago, I had a weird moment with my son, Joey. I said earlier, Joey's eight years old. He was in third grade. And Joey has always been one of those students who is basically straight A's. He's like middle of the, middle of the line A's and a couple B pluses occasionally. But all throughout third grade, the first three quarters, Joey had straight A's, perfect straight A's the whole year. But we noticed in the fourth quarter, for some reason, a couple of his grades started taking a dive. And then we did what parents did, which we started feeling personal. Like, like did we mess up? 
Are we not working with him enough? Are we not studying with him? Are we not doing enough with him? And it wasn't that. We were doing everything the same, so something was happening. We tried to get him to tell us what was going on, but he just wouldn't. And finally, he confessed to us what was actually happening. Now, Joey is the most honest person I've ever met in my life. Joey tells you everything about everything that's happened in his life. He doesn't have secrets. He doesn't hide stuff. But Joey came to us and he's like, I gotta, I gotta tell you something. I said, okay. He said, well, the last few weeks, they changed the seats around and I'm sitting next to some new people. And when I'm taking tests and quizzes, there's been a few times where I've accidentally looked at the person beside me's paper. And he said, I, I didn't mean to do it. I knew the answers on the quiz, but when I saw their paper, I felt guilty about it. So I just put the wrong answer for myself just so I wouldn't get in trouble. It's like, who, who are you? <laughs> Quit acting like your mother, you know, like. When I was in school, I bought into Reagan's trickle-down economic theory, which is if you see the answer from someone else's paper and it makes its way onto your paper, praise God, we all win, you know? And, but, but Joey felt guilty and he knew the right answer, but he was intentionally putting the wrong answer because he didn't want to get in trouble for cheating. And so and he was trying to cover it up by messing himself up over and over and over again. Like we all, we all do this in some weird way. We all cover up for ourselves. A few weeks ago, I got to church early like I always do, but on this particular Sunday, I had my two sons with me. And so we came to church early and every Sunday when I'm preaching, I do this. I go outside into the courtyard where we had grill and chill and I'll go and I'll pray and I'll walk around for maybe half an hour and I'll clear my heart and clear my head and I'll just, I'll pray for you and I'll think about some of you and the things you're going through and I'll pray for you. And I was out there praying and kind of thinking through my message, but I brought my boys with me. And so for some reason, I'm walking around praying and I look over and Gavin, my five-year-old, was hunched down on the ground and he'd found a marker, a Sharpie marker. And he decided that it would be a wise idea to write his name on the sidewalk at the high school. So he wrote Gavin. And I looked down as he's finishing up his name and I said, Gavin, what are you doing? He goes, I'm just writing my name here. And I said, why? why? And he tells me, he just thought it would be fun. He didn't know it would be a big deal. And I said, Gavin, this isn't our building. And even if it was our building, why would you write your name in permanent marker here? Like it doesn't make any sense at all. And so he tells me this and I start getting on to him about it. And then he starts crying and he's so sad. And I was like, Gavin, we could get in big trouble for this. Why did you do this? Please, please, please never do that again. So then fast forward a few weeks, last Sunday at Grill and Chill, I went over to where it was and the name is still there on the ground. Several months have gone by and his name is still there. And I remember saying to Gavin on the way, I wonder if your name is still on the sidewalk where you wrote it. I sure hope it is. And I sure hope someone washed it off or that it, it went away. And that day, as we were doing the food and things, I looked over and I walked with Gavin over to the area and I saw this happen as his dad. It was so funny. I, I watched him run over to the area and he found his name and he stood on it and he turned his foot sideways and he put one foot like this so I wouldn't see it. So I walked up to him and I was like, Gavin, what are you doing? He goes, I'm just standing here, <laughs> just standing. Yeah. Just standing here. I was like, what, why are you standing like that? He goes, just how I stand. Like he had an excuse for everything. And so I said, Gavin, buddy, what are you doing? He's like, no, nothing. So I said, okay, well let's go get some food together. Do you want a cookie? And he goes, yeah. And as he stood off, I said, uh Oh, and I pointed down and instantly he knew it was funny to me because Gavin was five and you don't have to train kids even at an early age. You don't have to train them to cover for themselves. Like there is this part in our human nature that when we do something we know is wrong, when we do something that we know that we could get caught at or in trouble for, we tend to hide. This idea goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Genesis 1 and 2, God creates the world and he makes man and woman. And as he's created them, he says, listen, I've placed you in this place. I've put you in this garden. You can eat the fruit from all the trees you want. Just don't eat the fruit from this one tree. And they do. They sin. They disobey what God told them to do. And instantly, for the first time in the history of humanity, for the first time in the course of the human narrative, sin enters the equation. And what sin does is sin reveals our brokenness. Sin reveals these places that we want to cover up, these places we want to hide. And so what does Adam and Eve do when they've sinned? Their response is to cover up. So they go and they find some, some fig leaves and they sew them together and they cover up their bodies because they're now ashamed. And God shows up and God says to them, like, what are you guys doing? And, and Adam says, well, we're hiding. And God says, well, why are you hiding? And he goes, well, it's her fault. She, she, she sinned. Like it, mankind, men especially have been blaming forever. And he blames her. And so what happens is sin enters the equation. And when sin enters the equation, they hide because they're ashamed. So these people, they hide their sin. And this has happened every generation since you and I, it's like we're hardwired when we sin, we're hardwired to hide it. We're hardwired to cover it up because we don't want people to know this. Why is that? I think it's because what we're afraid of is that if someone knows me, 
If someone knew all of me, if someone knew all of my sin, all of my shame, all of my darkness, that they wouldn't love me. They wouldn't see me the same anymore. So we, we spend our whole lives trying to project some kind of image about ourselves instead of, instead of just allowing God to heal us. Instead of moving past our past, we, we carry our past around our necks like a thousand pound brick and it's heavy and it's devastating and it costs so much. Now in the book of Numbers, Numbers is one of the first five books of the Bible. It's the fourth book of the Bible. It's one of five called the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the first five books of the Bible were called the Torah. They, they were the most beautiful, sacred words because in the time of Jesus, these were the words of God that people had. And the Torah was beautiful. In fact, many scholars say that everything you find through the rest of the Bible has its roots in the Torah. But when Jesus was teaching, often everything he said was either clarification or addition to the Torah. Like the Torah has everything in it. In fact, the Torah in those days was called, it was the way, it was the truth, and it was the life. In fact, when Jesus was a little boy and scholars, the, the teachers would teach about the Torah, they would literally take honey and put it on their fingers and they would touch it to the kids' mouths and they would say, see how sweet this is? See how sweet and beautiful this tastes? May the words of God, may the words of Torah be like honey on your lips. The Torah was so revered. In the book of Numbers, God shows up and he speaks to Moses. And he says, listen, like everyone has this tendency to do what you and I do, which is to hide, to stand on our name, to, to not put the right answer when we cheat on the test. And so God shows up and he says to Moses, I want to teach you how to deal with this. Numbers chapter five, it says, the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, any man or woman who wrongs another in any way, and so was unfaithful to the Lord is guilty. So what, what God comes out right away and says is when you sin, when you do anything that fractures your relationship with another person, even you're being unfaithful to God. When we sin, we don't sin in a vacuum. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. He says they're unfaithful to the Lord and they're guilty and they must confess the sin that they have committed. The first thing he says is when you've sinned, you have to confess it. You have to get it out. And the second thing is this. He says they must make full restitution for the wrong that they have done. Restitution literally just means to return to, to uh, not just to be forgiven, but to return your heart to the way that it was before you were wronged. He says they must make full restitution for the wrong that they have done, add a fifth of the value to it, and give, all, give it all to the person that they have wronged. So this is the message of God. When you sin, and all of us do, when you sin, there's something you have to do about it. And most of us buy into the lie, we can just hold on to it. Sin, it's no big deal. I'll just hold on to it, and I'll hold on to it for a while, and it won't really matter, and I'll just get past it at some point, but it's no big deal. But when we say that, we're buying into a lie. You see, so many people, Americans especially, we tend to believe that we sin in a vacuum. And what that means is we think that when I mess up, it doesn't really affect anybody. So it's like, I've got, I got a little porn addiction. No big deal, it's just me and a computer screen. I'm not even, I'm not even sleeping with someone else. It's just, it's just an image, it's a video, it's no big deal. Right, I'm just, it's not hurting anyone. It's just, just messing with myself, no big deal. We think that. The person who finds himself addicted to chat rooms where there's all kinds of filthy language happening all the time, things that are allowing their mind to go to places it never should go, they, they think it's no big deal, I'm not hurting anyone except myself. But this idea to the Hebrew readers, the people that wrote the Torah, the people that lived in that day, they would have never understood that. You see, they understood that God created us and he made us as individuals. But you were never created to, to live an individual life. You were created to do life in relationship and community with other people. You say, well, what does that look like? It means we're all interconnected. It means when you sin, when you, when you break God's rules and his commandments for us, when you do the things, it fractures the relationship we have with each other. And so when that happens, something has to transpire. When you sin, when you deal with this, we, something has to happen. And, and he says two things, we have to confess and make restitution. Now, the Hebrew words are interesting. The first word for the word confess is the word yad ha. And literally confess means, it means, it means to confess. It means to speak out, to cast out or to throw out. And what you understand about sin is this, when you sin, like for example, if you ever lied and carried a lie for a long time and you told a little lie and it wasn't that big of a deal, but in order to keep the lie from like coming into the light, you had to add another lie to it. And you had to add another lie to it and pretty soon it's this whole elaborate story. Then you gotta remember it and you gotta remember who you told what to in the lie. It gets heavy. And what starts out as something little small and it doesn't seem like a big deal, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And eventually what happens is it gets so heavy that it begins to consume you. So God says to Moses, tell the people to Yad Ha when they sin to confess, to get it out to stop holding onto it, to let it go because ultimately it's gonna weigh them down and it's gonna consume them. Get it out, speak it out, let it go, get rid of it, get on with your life. Yadha. 
And then he says, but that's not enough. It's not enough to just confess it. You have to do something else. And the word for make restitution is an old Hebrew word. The word is shuv. Now, what's interesting about this word is this word is the root word for other words, like the word teshuva, which literally means to repent or to do a complete 180 from where you were. Jesus used that word often. Shuv means to make restitution or try to make things right. It means to return to how things should be. It means that if I've done something that hurts you or wrongs you, if I've sinned, if I've lied to you, stolen from you, abused you, if I've hurt you in any way and I've sinned, that I have to go farther than just saying, I'm sorry and I've done this and I shouldn't have done this. I have to make restitution, which means I'm gonna make things right. And in making things right, my hope is that I return your heart and my heart to the way that they were intended to be, the way that they were before these things happened. I don't know if you've ever hurt someone dearly or been hurt by someone dearly. And it's like your heart hurts so bad and they apologize to you or you apologize to them and instantly it's like it feels like before the sin committed, before the thing happened. You ever had that before? Where it's like you confess and you say, I'm so sorry and I wanna make things right and I wanna fix things and instantly there's this healing, instantly things get better again. You see, the reality for so many of us is when we sin, when we do things that break and fracture the relationship we have with each other or with God, what tends to happen is we tend to carry the weight of it for a long time and then we tend to buy into lies about it. We tend to buy into these fictional things about our lives. In fact, I wanna do something. Nick, can I borrow you for a second? Come come here real quick. Just Nick, my man, come on, run up here. Okay, don't even worry about your shoes, bro. This is holy ground, you're fine. Okay, now for Christmas, I got a Yeti. I don't know if you've ever had a Yeti before, but this is the best cup I've ever had. Hi, Nick. And um, I got this, I I made a decision at the end of last year that I was gonna drink no soda, no tea, really nothing but water and an occasional glass of milk for for the whole year. I wasn't, and to this point, I've made it. It's been awesome. And this cup is a lot of the reason why. Now, do you know about these Yeti cups? They're amazing. So I'm gonna do a sales pitch for you. They are, they are double lined and vacuum sealed, which means whatever is in it stays its temperature. So if you put a hot drink in it, it stays hot for like, not just all day, but sometimes for two days. If you put ice in it, it will literally stay frozen ice for up to two days. I bought one for my dad a few weeks ago and I gave it to him as an early Father's Day present. And he kept texting me saying, this is magic. I don't know what's happening. It's amazing. My wife jokes with me that I have fallen in love with this more than her. I just love this cup. Now, now look, Nick, the cup is about half full. It's just, it's just got water in it right now. Now, it's no big deal. And here's what I want to do. I'll take this from me if you would and just hold it. Now, it is not that heavy, right? It's not. If you had to guess, maybe two pounds, maybe two pounds. It's not, it's certainly not that much. Do me a favor, put it in your left hand and do this. Take a step this way and hold it out this way for me. Just hold it like that, okay? And just hold it there for a moment, okay? You got it? Good, perfect. <laughs> this man, he just knows how to get it done. Now, Now that's not that heavy. And the reality about most of us when it comes to sin is we do things, now hopefully you're not out murdering people, that would be unbelievably heavy. But most of us don't struggle with that. If you you do, please find someone besides me to talk to. And, um, but like if you struggle with some sort of sin, lie, a little white lie, not a big deal. Porn, something that's just, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal because it doesn't hurt anyone. We struggle with the sin and then we tend to buy into lies about it. It's not that heavy. And so we carry it around. But what happens over time is it begins to get a little heavy over time. And so we buy into lies about sin. Like here's one of the lies. We think about sin that even it's not that big of a deal and no one's really going to notice it. So what I'll do with my sin is I'll hide it. Maybe if I live like this, no one will notice No one will pay attention. And we think that we're smarter than everyone else around us. So we buy into the lie that we can hold it. Like it's not that big of a deal. We can hide it and no one will see, no one will notice. But you know this, have you ever been around someone who's lying and you just know it? It's just just the weirdest thing you know. It's like when you sin, you think that you're hiding it from everyone, but everyone can eventually see. We buy into the lie that we can hide it. Another idea that we buy into, another lie, is not only can we hide it, but we think that we can handle it. Now let me ask you a question. You've only been holding it for like 60 seconds. How does it feel? It feels heavy, right? It's not that big of a deal, but it feels heavy. And so we buy into the lie that it's not that big of, it's, it's two pounds. Anybody can hold two pounds like this, but, but eventually that two pounds starts to feel like five pounds and, and 10 pounds and we think we can handle it. Some years ago, I worked for an organization and they decided to do this thing called Health Day. And on Health Day, they decided to bring everyone into the room to try to sell us on getting a gym membership from somewhere. So we all get into the room and we're excited to get like an hour break from work to listen to this man give his spiel. And we get into the room and the, the salesman takes his keys and he throws them to me and he goes, hey, I, I drive a Ford, can you do me a favor, run outside and in the back of the car, I left this box of books. Can you get them and bring them to me? 
Sure, no problem. So he parked his car like all the way on the other side of the campus where we worked. So I went and I got it and I carried the books. And if I had to guess, it was a big, awkward box, but it wasn't too heavy. It was maybe 15 or 20 pounds. And by the time I made the long walk holding this box of books, I walk in and I set them down in front of the man. And I'm, I'm a little winded, to be honest with you. I'm a little like, and I set them down and he goes, Jason, thank you so much. I didn't really need the box of books. How do you feel? And I said, I feel like punching you in the throat. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm honest. Um, and he goes, well, I just wanted to make a point. And the point is most Americans carry about this much weight around with them all the time, weight that we should lose. We shouldn't carry this much additional weight. That was his big point and it, it made sense. But in that moment, I just began to understand that this, this weight was like, it, it was heavy and it weighed on me. And even though it wasn't that much weight at first, it began to get, you're trembling, buddy. And, and, and the reason is, is like all of us tend with our sin to think that we can, we can do something about it. It's not the big video, I can hold it, I can hide it, but I don't, I don't really need help. The third thing that we buy into, the lie we buy into is that we can stop and we can heal. Just a little addiction, a little lie but I'm not gonna do this forever, I'll stop someday. And we, we think we can, I'll use porn as an example. So many people think I can get rid of the, the addiction. I'll just stop. But the problem is, is they'll do good for like four or five days. They'll, they'll be proud of themselves. I made it five days and I haven't even looked at a, a bad website, I'm good. And then they go out with their friends, something happens, they get upset, they get into a fight, they break up with their girlfriend, something happens and they find themselves frustrated and at the end of it, they just find themselves so mad, maybe had one too many things to drink and they find themselves at one o'clock in the morning sitting in front of a glowing computer on a site that they wish they hadn't gone to. We think we can just get rid of it on our own. Now, back to you again. Okay, you're pro, you okay? I'll take it back from you now, okay? Everybody give Nick a hand real quick, thank you. Appreciate it, man, thank you. Like you, you saw that, like it's a simple, silly analogy but all of us think that we can hold on to it, we can hide it. No one will notice. We think we can stop eventually whenever we want to stop and we can heal and we'll be fine. But the reality about sin is you can't. There has to be a way out of it. So the question is, how, how do we move past it? Like, you cannot take hold of the life God has for you. You'll never develop this rhythm in your life if you're constantly holding on to those kind of things. So the question is, how do we do it? Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 John. 1 John and the book of James give us two different verses that talk about how we deal with this. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess, there's that word again, Yadha, if we confess our sins, he being God is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and he'll purify us from all unrighteousness. So when we confess to God, it says that God is going to forgive us. He's going to, he's gonna forgive you of your sins. That almost begs the question, well, why, why should I even ask God for forgiveness if he's gonna forgive me? Well, it's both for God, but it's also for you. You need to confess it to get it off of you. But the second thing is he takes it a step farther and this is hard. The book of James says this, he says, therefore, confess your sins to each other. What? It means talk about your issues with each other. Confess them to one another. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be, what? Healed. So maybe healed. This is hard for us. You see, we think, God, I'm just gonna pray, God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And God's like, I forgive you, but I want you to move past this. Okay, well, how? how? Find someone else to tell. You need to find someone else who knows your issues, who will still love you. Some years ago, um, my wife and I we were several years into our marriage at this point, And I had this, this stuff that I'd carried that I just, nothing had happened during our marriage, but I had some secrets from the past that I just never completely come clean with Liz on. And I just, it, it weighed so heavy on me. And I finally said, listen, I've got to tell you something. And so I kind of just laid it all out for Liz. And my wife is really one of the most gracious, loving people I've ever met. And she looked back at me and she said, okay, um, you know, I'm glad you told me and that hurts, but... We're gonna to totally be good. We're gonna get through this, but do me a favor. <laughs> Would you tell someone else? I said, you're someone else. I told you, like, what are we doing? And she goes, no, no, just find someone else that you can tell. So I called up one of my pastors. It's actually a man who's one of our overseeing pastors of our church now. And I went to lunch with him at the Olive Garden. And um, I remember what I got. I got chicken Parmesan with a side of fettuccine Alfredo. And I love that meal, man. I, I can crush that meal. And so I get the food and it's not appetizing at all. My stomach is churning. And I said to him, I was like, okay, I, I need to talk to you about some stuff. Um, and I just kind of like laid it all out for him. I, I felt like I threw it up. You know, the, the word teshuva literally, uh, um, not teshuva, but yadha literally means to cast out, to speak out. I felt like I cast out, like I threw up all over this guy. And I told him all these things. Some years ago, when my son Joey was about two, we had a home that had two stories and Joey was upstairs in the middle of the night and I heard him scream this like blood curdling, ah, kind of scream. And I ran upstairs as fast as I could and I grabbed a hold of him and he goes, dad, my stomach, 
my tummy, my tummy. And I walked with him into the bathroom. And as I'm walking with him into the bathroom, he throws up all over me. Like some of you parents have had this happen. He throws up and I don't know that I knew what he had for dinner before, but I knew then there was like mac and cheese, like all over me. It was so nasty. And the weirdest thing happened. He, goes, oh, he throws up on me. Then he goes, oh, I feel better. Like, you feel better, but look at this. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm sitting with this pastor and I'm like, Bruh. and instantly two things happened. I felt better and I felt vulnerable. I felt better and I felt vulnerable. I threw up all over him. And then I remember sitting in this moment thinking like, he's going to judge me. He's going to condemn me. And he looked back across the table and he said this to me. He said, Jason, I have never loved you more than I love you right now. Do you, do you know how that healed me? Do you know what that did to my heart? He says, when I was your age, I did dumb things like you did. It's not right to do these, but you're not alone. I love you and I've never loved you more than I love you right here in this moment. Man, it, it healed me. Here's my question to you. Do you have anyone in your life who knows your issues? Do you have anyone? Not just your spouse. Is there, is there someone in your life that you make the decision that we're going to journey through life together that knows you, that loves you, that stands with you in your difficult days? Do you have anyone in your life who knows your issues? You see, this is the reason that access groups are such a big deal here. This week, I met with an awesome guy from our church, great, great guy. And we were talking about you know, church and had, just talking through a bunch of things. And I said to him, well, I said, are, you, are you in a group yet? And he goes, no, we've tried, but it's hard with our schedules and it's, you know, it's finding the night that works for us and stuff. And I said, well, have you started one or thought about starting one yet? And he goes, well, why? And I said, well, because if this is an issue for you, it's gonna be an issue for someone else and we need you. We need you leading a group. Why? Because the groups are the places where you get to know people. It's where you get out of rows and you find face-to-face -face conversation with people where you know each other and you love each other and you, you work through your issues with each other. You need people like that in your life. Now, I'm saying this to you. If you're here and you're not in a group, you've got to get in a group. And if you're here and you've been in a group, I'm begging you start a group because people need this. We need people that we can share our junk with and that we can be vulnerable with who will look at us and say, listen, I know all of you and I love you. I know, I know you and I love you. You see, you're, you're only as sick as the secret you keep. You're only as sick as the secret you keep. You need some people in your life who know you and who love you and who will walk with you through these issues. Look, like, here's kind of the final point of today, okay? Check this out. I don't need to be transparent with everybody. I don't, you don't, I don't, I don't need, you ever know that person on Facebook who like puts all their junk up on Facebook? Like you don't need to be transparent with everybody, but I must be transparent with somebody. And here's the reason this matters. As we talk about this series, as we go through these different elements that I believe are these rhythms that we can develop as we follow God, you won't get past first base in your relationship with God if you're carrying around a weight of sin, of shame, of guilt, of remorse, you won't. You'll do all the, the rituals, but they'll feel empty and meaningless. You'll pray, but feel like your prayers never get past the ceiling. You'll fast, but feel like all you did was not eat. You, you'll have, you'll try to do evangelism and share your faith with other people, but it'll just, it'll never seem to work because you're so consumed with your past, with your decisions, with your failures, with your insecurities, with your issues. And I'm telling you, you have to be transparent with somebody. You see, when we confess to God, it says he's faithful and he will forgive us every single time. But some of you have found yourself over and over and over struggling with the same issues and the same cycle of sin. And I'm telling you, you will never find freedom until you find someone to confess to. So here's my challenge, my question. Is there anybody in your life who knows your junk? Is there anybody in your life who knows all of you and who says, I love you? Is there? Because if there's not, this is your opportunity to confess to God to receive his forgiveness, but to confess to someone else, to find someone who will look at you after your most vulnerable moment, the moment you're like, oh, here it all is. You need someone who will look at you and say, and I love you. So here's my challenge for you. Will you join me in this pursuit of becoming whole? in this pursuit of not being this broken, fractured, sinful person, but of becoming whole. Listen, the addiction you've been trying to break for years, you'll finally be able to break it. You'll finally find freedom when you confess to one another. You will. You need people in your life who know your issues, who will challenge you, who will call you to a better life, and who will
will still say, in spite of all of it, I love you. So will you join me in this effort? Here's what I believe. If we'll start here, if we'll get our hearts clean, our hearts pure, if we'll allow God to mend the broken pieces of our heart as we confess to receive forgiveness and healing, if we'll do this, I believe that some of the things we're gonna ask you and challenge you to do over the next seven weeks will take on such unbelievable life for you that you will become the best Christian you know. You will have the deepest, most intimate, most beautiful relationship with God. You will experience God in a way that you never thought was possible. Maybe you're like so many Christians and you do things for God and you do it out of duty and I'm telling you, it will shift to the light. Maybe you're here and you've done a lot of things to serve God out of obligation and I'm telling you, your heart will be flooded with joy. What would it look like if all of us did this? If we developed this rhythm in our life, this cadence of God, I'm gonna confess to you to be forgiven and I'm gonna confess to others so that I can be healed. Would you bow your head and close your eyes all across this room? For just the next moment, no one's looking and no one's talking. This is your moment with God. And as we pray this, I'm gonna ask you, some of you just need to take a moment to confess with him now. Just you need to tell him what's up in your heart. Maybe others of you need to make a decision that you're gonna seek someone out this week to be an accountability partner, to be someone that you confess to, that you, you share your deepest, darkest things with. I'm gonna pray for you now. God, uh, this one is so much easier to talk about than it is to actually live out. God, it's hard to be honest because when we're honest, we're vulnerable and no one likes that feeling. But God, I really do believe that we'll never be fully loved until we're fully known. We'll never be able to receive love until we're fully known. And that, both, that means both by you, but it also means by others. So God, I pray that this week we'll have the courage to confess to you. God, I thank you that when we confess, you don't judge us, you don't zap us, you don't send someone from heaven to punish us, but instead you're faithful to forgive us. But God, I pray that while that part's the easy part, I pray that we'll have the courage to do the hard part. I pray that we'll have the courage, God, to seek out other relationships, to get into a group, to lead a group as they kick off in a few weeks, to, to build intentional relationships with others where we can confess so that we can experience healing. God, I pray that as a result of this, you'll heal our hearts, that you'll open us up to be ready to receive what you have for us for the next couple months as we dig into your word together and as we develop this rhythm of being followers of Jesus who don't just know him, but who love him in a beautiful, profound kind of way. God, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name.